Hello, I'm Ben Wattenberg. The first hundred days of the new Republican Congress are over. Most of the contract with America has been passed by the House and awaits scrutiny by the Senate and the President. But is that all? Is this the beginning of the end or just the end of the beginning? Are we perhaps moving into a new political era, into uncharted political territory? Joining us to discuss this notion are William Schneider, CNN political analyst, professor of political science at Boston College and resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, Thomas Mann, director of governmental studies at the Brookings Institution and co-author of the book Renewing Congress, James Pinkerton, author of the forthcoming book What Comes Next? The End of Big Government and the New Paradigm Ahead, and lecturer in political management at George Washington University, and Jeffrey Eisenach, president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. Well, we know about the first hundred days, so now the question before this house is, what about the next hundred months? This week on Think Tank. The late Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, said, all politics is local. Well, it may be that the new speaker, Newt Gingrich, has turned that dictum on its head. When the Republicans announced their contract with America, it began turning the 1994 election toward a national referendum about the Democratic-controlled Congress, about President Clinton, and about the contract itself. The Republicans won overwhelmingly, taking control of both houses of Congress for the first time in 40 years. Gingrich wasted no time converting the perceived referendum into a mandate for action. The Republicans said they would honor their contractual vows. The Democrats attacked, but nine out of ten contract items passed the House, everything but term limits. Some analysts say that the first hundred days was showbiz and that over the next few years, tougher issues may well tear the Republican coalition apart. Issues like abortion, a flat tax, school prayer, affirmative action, tax cuts, and big spending cuts. Other analysts say that what Gingrich and the Republican Congress have done signals a sea change in American thinking and a turn toward progressive conservatism. It's been an astounding uh, political time, and now uh, we should ask uh, what is next, what is going to happen in the next uh, 100 months, and let's go around the horn once quickly, starting with you. Uh, Jeff Eisenach, where are we going? This is a revolution. It's a people's revolution. It is not yet clear whether it will be a Republican revolution. For 100 days, they have acted like a majority. If they continue to act like a majority, like the new majority party they might be, they may be the majority party. What is clear, though, is the people are going to have a different kind of government. All right. Uh, Jim Pinkerton, for formerly the deputy director of policy for the Bush administration. All right. Uh, well, Gingrich has clearly moved the bully pulpit from the White House to H204 in the Capitol. He's got an enormous political momentum be moving him now. It remains to be seen if the policy agenda that the contract touches on uh, will equal the, the challenge and the mandate that he sought for himself. Tom Mann, Brookings Institution. Americans don't take very kindly to revolutions. They're a pragmatic, practical lot. They want government to get a little smaller, work a lot better. Uh, but revolutions uh, are for the French, not for the Americans. All right. Uh, <laughs> Bill Schneider of CNN and my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute. Ben, I think there is a new majority coalition that's governing, that's really in power now in the United States. It's a diverse coalition of interests that have one thing in common. They all have a grievance with big government. Middle class taxpayers want lower taxes. Gun owners don't want the gov federal government to take their guns away. Uh, racial backlash voters identify the federal government with promotion of the civil rights agenda, and they're getting a payoff with the attack on affirmative action. Religious conservatives want less judicial activism. Business people want less regulation. They will hold together as long as they see a liberal threat, which they did in Bill Clinton, and that's why they materialized as a majority. As long as they perceive a liberal threat out there, that coalition is going to hold together and it's going to be very powerful. Uh, let me ask one question now. We all live in this uh, sort of insular community that over the last uh, 20 years or so ha has spotted a sea change each week. <laughs> oh my God, the world is changing. Uh, is it possible and plausible that this one is for real? 40 years. 40 years it's been since the Republicans had control of both houses of Congress. That's a pretty big change to me. 
<laughs> I think it's also fair to say that, that people in their bones sense that bureaucratic organizations, whether it's the Soviet Union, IBM, or the federal government, are in a process of collapse. And that that's the, the sense of slow motion panic that people feel over that is much of what underlay the Republican victory in 1994, just like it caused Bush to lose in 92. I'd second that and, and come back and to, to what Tom said. I think this is a very pragmatic revolution that what people have seen since 1976, they've elected reformer after reformer after reformer. Jimmy Carter was a reform president, was going to bring in zero-based budgeting. Ronald Reagan promised to fix it all. Bush said he'd continue that. When Bush failed, they brought in Clinton. He failed. What they have is they have a government that is wildly out of step with everything they see working around them. And, and in that sense, I think this is very pragmatic, but, this, but the change is not a small one. They've tried small changes. The old Democratic coalition's been dead for a long time, Ben. It hasn't been able to muster a majority, really, in presidential elections since Lyndon Johnson. Yeah, but but, it was but finally, this time, they managed uh, to lose their base in the, in the House of Representatives. So that is a major change. I think people are more skeptical of government. In a sense, they're more inclined to think of themselves as conservatives than liberals, and therefore there is an opportunity for Republicans now. There's a real market for change, but Republicans run the risk of thinking Americans are economic libertarians. They're not ideologues, they're pragmatists. They may be skeptical of government, but they're solicitous of government as well. And so we're going to have to see whether the Republican sees the opportunity or, in fact, whether some more centrist solution, one actually identified originally by Bill Clinton in his presidential campaign, manages to move into that open space. Uh, uh, Jeff, you are uh, the president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation. You have been a longtime associate of uh, now Speaker Gingrich uh, and a conservative spokesman. Could you tell us what is the nature of this particular modern conservative we're sit, we're sort of agreed that there's a sea change it's a sea change toward what I, if I, you had your way or in your judgment I, I think it's a sea change away from big bureaucratic centralized institutions of government actually hiring people spending money to accomplish things towards a government which is much leaner but ultimately much more effective and much less ambiguous I mean one of the things people know about our bureaucracies is you can't it's not that you get the wrong answer it's you can't get any answer there's nothing out there but a sea of ambiguity I think what what this revolution will do if it works is it will bring in a much clearer and cleaner sense of what the law is and how it's implemented and that'll happen I think a lot through the tax code it will happen with uh, with legal reform with tort reform with regulatory reform so that what you'll end up with is a government which works a lot better and is a lot smaller in terms of the number of people working for it but the rhetoric isn't that pragmatism the rhetoric is government is terrible let's knock it down government is the problem Americans don't think the Social Security Administration is a big bad bureaucracy. They think it works just fine in getting their checks out to them on time. So no, wait, sometimes the time rhetoric time. of the Gingrich Revolution gets away from the realities time. of Americans' encounters with that time. You're, you're, you're peddling a little <laughs> bit of inside the Beltway wisdom here. I mean, look at the polls that show that young people think that they're more likely to find a UFO in their backyard than they are to collect their Social Security. There is... Maybe they're right. Everything else well, changes, if, right. if, if that's the case, then, 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 then the politicians in, 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 who, who are defending a system that is going to rip off an entire generation of young people are going to wind up with their heads on pikes before all said and done. But, but I'd say something else, and that, and that is, I, because I, I think your point's well taken, I, I, for, I, but the welfare debate, I think, was a major stepping stone. For, the, for this new majority, because for, for a week of debate, you had Republican after Republican stepping up, and instead of talking about how we've got to starve a few kids to save a few dollars, which is what this party's been saying for 30 years, you had the, the entire Republican Party standing up and saying, we're reforming welfare to do the right thing. Look, look, well, look, <laughs> people want to solve problems. I agree with Tom. They want to solve problems, and Bill Clinton was elected with a mandate. He said he could make government work. He had people with impressive credentials, long lists of degrees. They were very smart. He won on brain power. George Bush didn't have a clue, sorry. But that was what elected <laughs> yeah, Bill Clinton. Clinton. <laughs> right. he, this was the brain power. This was it. It was brain power. It was Pinkerton's fault. And know the view that. was, right, right. we want the, this guy because he's smart and he says he can make government work. The message in 94 was, it ain't working. The Republicans were elected with a mandate to solve problems with less government. They said, we know how to solve these problems. We can do it with less government. I think the skepticism that Tom is talking about is sometimes 
they go towards the rhetoric of saying, we're going to fix things even if they're not broken. That's the image of the school lunch <laughs> program. Well, What's wait, broken wait, there? Uh, and uh, let's just uh, go transportation to, to some and of the environmental some, protection. Some of the things <laughs> that Republicans in this new conservative wave have been saying over the years. One of the things was, and we've sort of dealt with that, uh, is we're going to get the government off our backs. Everybody yeah. seems to be agreed that that at least is a, is a goal, although how far that would go remains to be seen. Uh, what about that one about ending the welfare state? They, they, they've said this is the, 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 the contract is going to roll back the welfare state. Is, that gonna, I mean, is this where, where we're headed? May I make a prediction? A hundred months from now, uh, the Social Security uh, system will be paying out a lot more money than it is now. The Medicare program will, will be paying out a lot more money than it is now. And welfare recipients will not be greatly changed from, from what they what they are now. Republicans are promising a sort of withdrawal from, in some respects, uh, from this system will transform these recipients. And you know, the, the hard truth is it's going to take a, a lot of work and a lot of money to help get people yeah, but, on but, their but feet no, no, and but, working in jobs. And that requires a, even government administration to get it done. It's a standard liberal dogma. I, no, I it's conservative. I, no, it's called big me. government I, I, conservative. I, I, I testified today before uh, the Banking Committee on the question of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And there were Joe Kennedy and Barney Frank up there uh, criticizing in the most vehement, vicious terms, Henry Cisneros for trying to move in the direction of vouchers and empowering people, uh, essentially defending the old system. And they were making the point that Tom's making. Everything's terrible. Things are going to remain terrible. Nothing that you can do to try and make things better is going to make no. any, is no. going to make any, well, you say, yeah. well, there'll be just that. as many I mean, welfare recipients. I support recipients. vouchers Medicare and decentralization. Be, well, but none of them will make a big difference. Tom, Tom, hold on. Yeah. If, if, if in the year, <laughs> uh, if 100 months from now, in the year 2003, we have got the same welfare system, a disaster that everybody across the spectrum agrees with, that is harming people. Forget the, the wasted money, that is harming people. If we have the same sort of a welfare system, but a little bit less in 2003, then this is no sea change. This is, well, there's a welfare system and there's the welfare state. The welfare system will be changed. Even President Clinton was elected exactly. on a mandate to change the welfare system. What the welfare state means is entitlements. Now that the Republicans have made some headway towards at least trying to change. What has Clinton accomplished as president? Really two things. Deficit reduction, he reduced the deficit by one third every year, and free trade. Those are the two biggest items on his agenda. Those aren't exactly radical. He got in trouble for And they're not exactly democratic. Uh, they're <laughs> I mean, not exactly you know, right. democratic. So why did he get in trouble? I've t spoken to a lot of conservatives, and they'll always give you the same list. Gays in the military, Lonnie Guineer in the Justice Department, the Economic Stimulus Plan, comprehensive health care reform, big new crime prevention spending, the energy tax. You know what? He got in trouble for things he proposed. He didn't deliver a single one of those things. And liberals were dismayed. They said, we like that agenda, but you didn't deliver any of it. That's why he was in so much trouble. He w got in trouble because he proposed things that sounded like big government. Right, Look right. at health care. Yes, okay. you, 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 hold on one second. You, you have touched on, a, on an interesting point here. We're, we're just kind of going through whether we're going to see the fulfillment of certain bits of this uh, conservative uh, rhetoric. Uh, we've talked about getting the government off our backs. We've talked about rolling back the welfare state. Uh, what is also said about this revolution is that it is going to change from a social welfare state to a social police state. And we hear stuff from mainstream Democrats and uh, uh, more liberal people that the uh, fight against abortion, uh, the treatment of homosexuality, school prayer, pornography, TV censorship, that this is all embedded, implicit in the Gingrich revolution. Comments? Not, not part of the majority agenda. No. If the Republican Party chooses to be the party of social oppression, it will not choose to be, it will be choosing not to be the majority party, and I, I, don't, I don't believe that's possible. The Republicans get in trouble, they got in trouble, I think, in Houston, when their convention was perceived or interpreted, there's a lot of discussion about whether it really was uh, stigmatizing, but it was perceived as stigmatizing. Democrats always made the mistake in the past of glorifying unconventional minorities, homosexuals, un single mothers, Republicans get in trouble when they seem to stigmatize those same groups, and that's why they want to steer clear of that. Religion is an issue that drives a wedge right through the heart of that Republican coalition, just as race does the, to the, the Democrats. The contract with America was an explicitly secular document. There's almost no reference to, of, any, of any kind on abortion or anything like that. 
the, 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 the only chance I think that Clinton has, as, as Bill saying, is you know, a, a few more Henry Fosters. Mm -hmm. You know, could really could, the Re Republicans could rise to the bait and say, aha, here's our chance to, to, to take Houston back into the you, people's... You think Henry Foster is going to hurt the Republicans? I think there's the danger of things like that is that it, it, it brings out you know, the Christian coalition saying, you know, we're against Henry Foster, and by the way, we insist on an uh, all-pro-life ticket in 96. Yeah. Right. He Ralph, said Ralph it under pressure Romney, from anti-abortion activists who were enraged by the nomination of uh, Foster. And Clinton and the Republicans didn't really want to, the Republicans did not want to talk about abortion. And my guess is Ralph Reed didn't either from what he subsequently wrote. He was forced into it because the anti-abortion constituency was furious, outraged, that the president would uh, nominate a Surgeon General who had performed abortions. Ben, I do want to say this, and that is that the, the Christian coalition, I believe, is a coalition of people who feel oppressed by government yep. imposing values on them that they, that they disbelieve in very deeply. Yep. And what I believe they are looking for is freedom, which is why education choice is so far at the top of the agenda, why they're pulling their kids out of schools and asking for their money that's back right. so they can do homeschooling. If that's what the agenda is all about, then I don't think there's any conflict here at all. I, and I frankly just don't <laughs> see much of the Christian coalition saying, here's the prayer your kids have got to say in school but and we want to pass the way it into law. They see that's themselves, the that's not the way others see them. Absolutely. Others see them as attempting to take over government to Christianize Absolutely. the country. That's Churchgoers the are the most important group within the Republican Party. Their interests are diverse, I agree with you, but they will create a fissure uh, within the Republican Party. It can't be glossed over. The Republicans and the Speaker did well in the first hundred days in keeping these issues off to the side, but there will be demands for votes on difficult issues that will at times divide the Republicans and potentially cause problems in the presidential nominating politics. It's a reality, but they are so important to the Republican Party that they have to make peace with the them. The issue for the Republicans on education, both school, school prayer and school vouchers, is leadership. Somebody's going to have to get up and say to the Christians, say, look, your idea of school prayer for everybody is not going to work. The idea that will work is school vouchers. And that has to be an uh, argument sold not only to the, to the Christian right, but also to the rest of the country, which is impatient with the, the stagnation of, of bureaucratic education. Let me America. ask a question. Um, uh, something we mentioned in the, in the setup piece, this uh, Tip O'Neill idea that all politics is local. It occurs to me, you know, we all sort of repeated that as a mantra for so many years, oh, all politics is local. Of course, when you have a, uh, a liberal majority in the legislature, that becomes a very liberal statement. It says, if you take care of the person's Veterans Administration check, if you see the Social Security check, you can do any damn fool thing you want to in terms of national policy, which is what ultimately got the Democrats in, in trouble. Now, with the apparent, underscore apparent, nationalization of the Congress, uh, it, 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 does that then become a, uh, a, a, a conservatizing movement because you are talking issues rather than did your VA check get delivered? Well, look, I think the, the election was nationalized principally not by the contract, but by President Clinton. Mm -hmm. I think he was the central issue in all those races. What happened was... But you can't you, get the toothpaste back in the tube. I mean, the next time well, we go around and, and have uh, national platforms, people are going to take them much more seriously. If the Republicans believe they're going to get reelected without paying a lot of attention to constituency service, they're going to come in for a no, big I, surprise. I uh, mm. Politics is always a combination of local and national forces. National became more prominent in 94 for a host of reasons. In 96, Republicans are going to do well in the elections for the House and the Senate, partly on the basis of their strength locally. Good candidates, lots of money, and a story to tell. But let's understand that a guy like Tip O'Neill could get away with saying all politics is local because he was operating within the paradigm that Franklin Roosevelt had set up. What Gingrich is trying to do is well, the, the paradigm has already crashed. The democratic paradigm has crashed. What the Republicans are trying to do is create a, their own paradigm so that equally ordinary, run-of-the-mill right. Republican and, and, and politicians... Everybody here seems to be convinced that the de democratic paradigm is, is crashed and so on and so forth. On the other hand, as we speak, the polls for Clinton are going up. The polls against Gingrich, are, are, uh, the negatives are, 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 uh, are very high. The Democrats have, have launched a uh, rhetorical counteroffensive about th this is really a war on kids. They're balancing the budgets on the backs of the poor. They're taking away school lunches. Uh, isn't it plausible that just politically 
we are way out ahead of our supply lines and that the yeah. Democrats are going to come back with this stuff and terrorize the country about taking away your school lunch. The, the old ketchup argument with Reagan. Mm -hmm. the, the, the notion that Washington, D.C. is going to get too far out in front of the American people is so silly <laughs> on its face. That, um, but, but the truth is, I don't think the numbers show that by any stretch of the imagination. There were two polls in the last two weeks that were very important and very underattended to. The LA Times came out with a poll that uh, the, the same week that the Washington Post poll came out that scared everybody saying that the people were running away from the Republican contract. The LA Times the same week came out with a poll showing that 46% of Americans thought Republicans weren't cutting enough compared to 14% who thought they were cutting too much, 29% they were, who thought they were doing about the right thing. Three to one, not cutting enough. Next week you have a poll from Times Mirror. In December 1993, 12% of Americans wanted an, wanted an independent presidential candidate. December 1994, 18%. March 1995, that number is up to 23%. I think those two numbers are related. I think people are looking at Washington, and the question they're asking isn't, are these people going too far? The question they are asking is, are they doing enough? Are they solving the problems? Yeah. I mean, Clinton was elected to make government work. People said he didn't. The Republicans were elected to solve problems with less government. They're solving some problems. I agree. Welfare, unfunded mandates. They're creating other problems. People don't know why they're attacking the school lunch program. That's becoming like midnight basketball. It's a symbol of, of going too far. Uh, so I think Clinton may very well run the next election. You were suggesting it's the Democrats are not sunk as a gigantic midterm election in reverse. Democrats used to get elected and reelected repeatedly during the 1980s because they would say, you got Reagan in there, you got Bush. They may go too far. You got to elect us to make sure there's a check and a balance. Clinton may run a campaign to the dismay of his Democratic colleagues in Congress and say, you're pretty happy with the way the Republican Congress is going, but they threaten to go too far. You've got to keep me in there with my veto pen to make sure that doesn't happen. All right, let, let, let me, we, we, we are running out of time. I, I want to go around the horn uh, one more time uh, with the stipulation that no one except perhaps me knows the future and hear from you uh, an answer to the basic theme of, of this program is, is this the beginning of a new conservative era? And we'll start with you, Jeff. Absolutely. A uh, 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 hundred months from now, government, the federal government will be at or below 15 percent of gross domestic product compared with 22 percent today. A new majority party will be controlling both houses of Congress and the White House, probably the Republican Party that remains to be seen. And we will be seeing, I think, dramatically faster economic growth. We will be seeing dramatic drops in, in the number of people on welfare. And by the way, Social Security will have been fundamentally reformed, because it has to be. We're in a post-bureaucratic era. Um, it remains to be seen whether the Republicans or the Democrats can, can, can fill this, this void left by this crash uh, uh, of, of big government. The other, the other question is, can a conservative movement, which is in fact a right-wing movement, impose the kind of leadership that, that want to take the country forward. Tom Mann, yeah, go ahead. The Republicans have an opportunity to build a new majority in this country, but to do it they have to deliver. And delivering means dealing with the uh, root causes of insecurity and anxiety that Americans feel. I am not persuaded that simply saying less government will solve that problem. Americans are not ideologues. Republicans in Congress right now are. Until they demonstrate that they can deliver in a practical sense, they will lose that opportunity. Bill Schneider. I agree with Tom. I think that the Republicans have an opportunity. We are entering a conservative era, and I don't think we're going to go back to big government. But suppose they don't solve the problems they were elected to solve or create new problems. What are Americans going to do? Well, I think they're, they're showing two kinds of responses. One is if they figure the Democrats, they're very skeptical, the Democrats can make government work, and the Republicans cannot solve problems with less government, they're going to say, what we have to do is get the politicians out of there. That's why Perot was very attractive. You want to make government work? Get the politics out of government, is the popular belief. A Colin Powell is very popular these days. The same appeal that Ross Perot had. Not a professional politician knows how to get things done. A revolt against politics is in the offing. The other thing they do is solve their problems for themselves. They move to suburbs and they buy their own governments that they can control and put walls around themselves. They have their own schools, their own police, their own fire departments. They buy a private government. That's another solution. All right. In other words, we're going to get under the hood and fix it. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill Schneider, Jeffrey Eisenach, uh, Tom Mann, and Jim Pinkerton. And thank you. Please send your comments or questions to 
New River Media, 1150 17th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036, or we can be reached via email at thinktv at aol.com. For Think Tank, I'm Ben Wattenberg. This has been a production of BJW Incorporated in association with New River Media, which are solely responsible for its content.